I'm Bridget Schulte. I'm a writer and journalist. Uh, and the director of the Better Life Lab at New America. We're delighted to have you all here where we're going to talk about child care in America. Uh, first, we want to thank our partners, the Royal Consulate of uh, Norwegian Consulate General, uh, Ellen Drum Brownlee, right, and Christian Rosjo, uh, for their generous support and uh, partnership for this and a number of other events that we've had. Uh, particularly, we see this as an extension of another event that we had on paid family leave. Uh, you, we've just come out with our major new report where we've mapped out the infrastructure of child care in the United States and we make the argument that paid family leave is really infant care. So I'm going to introduce our panel and then we're going to get started. So, um, let's see if my right, yeah, I'm a little flummer, flummoxed with the, the uh, microphone buckle here. So on my right is, uh, I'm not even going to try, Nina Drange, it's not even how you pronounce it. It's very, Drania. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, she's from, uh, from, she's an economist and research fellow with Statistics Norway. She flew in just this morning. From, from yesterday, yesterday night. Yesterday night, last night. From, uh, from Norway. And she's been doing some fascinating research on early care and learning and child care in Norway. So we're here to learn about the, the Norwegian experience. Uh, then we have Fabienne Doucette. She is the Associate Professor of Early Childhood Education and, Pro and Program Leader of uh, Childhood Education at New York University, and has done, obviously, an awful lot of work in early care and learning. Excited to hear from her. And then we have Alice Projanski. Uh, she's a documentary photographer covering women in labor. And if you've noticed, as you were sitting here, it's uh, her photos that have been uh, uh, flashed throughout. They're beautiful and amazing, and we'll, we'll keep flashing them throughout the evening, and so please do uh, Pay attention and enjoy them. And then finally, we've got Humberto Cruz. He is the program officer with the Right to Play. Uh, so we're very excited to hear about how play is the work of childhood. So I'm going to, since this is about the making the case for universal child care, I'm just going to start talking a little bit about the the care report. We've got care reports out there. Uh, please take them with you as you leave. Uh, but what we wanted to do, uh, we wanted to map out what we knew uh, existed here as sort of the current reality in the United States with child care. I, I'm a mother of two, and I can tell you that it's just incredible. It's what turned my hair gray, just trying to get my child care for two kids in the Washington, D.C. area. At one point, I couldn't find infant care, so I had my, uh, my baby with a nanny share with the neighbors up the street. I had my two-year-old in a child care uh, development center, and then I had to hire a babysitter because I could never get home from work on time. And if any one of those three things fell apart, my life was over. And you know, the traffic jam was like, well, there goes. <coughs> so child care is really tough. I, I experienced that personally. And so we wanted to see was that a universal experience. And what I can tell you, we looked at cost, quality, and availability of care in all 50 states in the District of Columbia. Um, and what we then came up with a cumulative measure. And what we were able to find is that no single state does all three things well. And uh, an early care and learning uh, infrastructure can really work. It needs to be affordable, it needs to pay its caregivers and teachers well, it needs to be available, easily accessible, and it needs to be high quality. And uh, what we did is we divided the states into quartiles and then we visited one state in each quartile with a video, a video crew. And if you go to our website, you can see some of these videos of stories of uh, teachers and uh, parents and providers. <coughs> Uh, and Massachusetts was one of the best states that we went to, and we profiled a caregiver who, like all the other uh, child care teachers and workers in the United States, earns less than $10 an hour. Our than half of our early care learning teachers qualify for at least one form of employment assistance, like the food stamps and the um, Turnover rate is high, and this is really what, where quality comes from, is having high quality early care learning teaching staff and it would make it very difficult for them. Um, all forms of education in the United States are subsidized, except zero to five education. It costs about $12,000 to educate a child from K to 12. And yet, for the zero to five years, uh, we expect parents to pay the bulk of that. What we found in our care report is that uh, child care in the United States is more expensive uh, on average than in-state college tuition, and you don't have 18 years to save up for it. 
uh, we found that uh, child care is very difficult to find, largely in the rural western states. Say, for instance, in South Dakota, it's the state that has the largest percentage of children in families where all parents work, and it also is a very difficult to find uh, quality child care. We also found that quality tends to be very low, only uh, so, something like 11% of all child care family homes and uh, child care centers are accredited by national bodies. So we have a long way to go here. And so what I'd like to do is turn it over to the panel at this point. Fabian, why don't you start and let's talk a little bit about what we know about the zero to five years. Why is it so critical uh, when it comes to early childhood development? Sure. Well, um, during this period, um, children's brains are developing really rapidly and uh, are forming all kinds of connections. And it's one of those critical periods during which um, all the things to which children are being exposed are really impacting them. Um, there's been a lot of attention paid to this lately. Um, you may be aware of a lot of attention being paid to the stresses that young children experience and how these early stresses really have very significant long-term impacts. So it's really critical to be thinking about the early years and how the kinds of experiences and the environments and the um, opportunities and, and um, what we expose young children to um, is really significant. And um, on uh, the, the, what you just were talking about with the care report, we corroborated those, those findings in, um, I was on a, a panel with the National Academy of Sciences and we uh, recently issued a report, was last year, on birth to eight. And we were, it was a follow up to the Neurons to Neighborhoods report, which was really focusing on this um, early childhood, the early years and the, and the brain development, the rapid brain development in the early years. And we were really interested in the workforce and in what's happening with the workforce, trying to bring together the science of early childhood development with now what do we do about uh, teaching and preparing um, the people who are going to be serving those children and we found just like you did you know there, there just really isn't um, consistency even though the research clearly shows that paying teachers well paying caregivers well is extremely important to their well-being um, it, that's that's something that that as a nation we have not galvanized around and so um, there's been some really fascinating work out of uh, the Berkeley Center um, on early childhood workforce on depression among early childhood care providers and considering the importance of say um, how young children pick up their cues from mirroring the visual expressions of the people around them. This is why we should also be really concerned about maternal depression and maternal health and well-being um, and, and young parents in general. They're or early parents of young children is what I mean, um, parents of young children, um, is that their, their mental health and their well-being is, is significantly um, important for how their children are doing. So we, we really should care a lot about um, how all of the people who are involved on a regular basis closely in those everyday interactions um, with young children, how they're faring. Let's turn to you, Alice. Um, so you're a mom, you, uh, you know, with your work as a journalist and a photographer, you know, you are out there kind of cataloging sort of everyday experiences. Talk a little bit about your own experience as a, as a working mother, a working parent, and, wh and what you see out there, and, you know, particularly in light of how important having this kind of high quality experience is for, for little kids. So um, when I, I have one child who's in universal pre-K and also paid after school. And I have um, one child who's in a family daycare. And I think part of what is so important to do, which we've talked about, is um, it's important to talk about this and to change perceptions. So um, when I come to a panel like this, it's because I have a daycare provider and a partner who will help me to do this. Um, and you mentioned it costs, I think you said $12,000 to pay for a child to be educated from K through eighth grade. That's approximately what I paid for one child in daycare last year out of pocket as a freelance journalist. When I I started this project, um, it's called Women's Work. It's about middle class to upper class working mothers in New York. Um, because when I was going to have my first child, I was terrified because I thought as a journalist, how is this gonna impact my work? I think it's gonna destroy everything and I need to, to, needed to look at it. And I need to look at people who are similar to me, who were, the reason I chose to photograph specifically middle to upper class mothers, I have separate bodies of work about working class parents, is the inequality in the situation is so apparent that it would be, uh, it, 
it wouldn't make sense to include these different situations in one project because while the middle class mothers struggle a lot with paying for daycare and with, as you mentioned, the logistics of it all, um, we have a very different situation than our childcare providers who I know that, um, you know, women I've spoken to, as you said, living in New York City make $9 an hour to take care of children and they have their own children. So the writer who worked on this piece, Alyssa Court, um, talks about a chain of care. And so it's going from someone like myself who can pay for a daycare to somebody who has maybe a unlicensed daycare or a, you know something that's not really um, well regulated, caring for their child or free child care. One of the nannies that I photographed for a different story, her child had to live in Paraguay because she couldn't afford to have her child here. She was a nanny. So these are different situations, but to come back to women's work, um, I noticed that a lot of women, the woman who you'll see pumping breast milk in her office, she did receive paid maternity leave, but she also said that daycare was by far the most expensive thing they paid for. And you know, she's paying for an apartment in New York City. She's, um, all of the women in this project work because we have to, but also because that formed our identity. And I wanted to look at the intersection of work, motherhood, and identity. The good news is, coming out of this, I've realized that there's such an interest, and I'm so gratified to hear all these people studying this and all you that came to talk about this. It's such an important topic of conversation. You know, it's interesting you talk about inequality, and that's certainly one of the things that we found in the report. Uh, or, you know, we looked at the, a lot of the brain science that's out there, and you look at just even the language, you know, the language gap. What is it, the 30 million, was it, is that about right? 30 million word gap by age three, is that right? That's a Overstatement. It's a, yeah. Okay. <laughs> that's a. That's a. That's. It's, there's a lot that's been made of that that isn't necessarily. Um, but there's a lot more to it, I think. That, mm -hmm. so, yeah. Okay. So be, going into a whole. Okay. Thing. So we'll we'll be careful, but there is. Uh, I think there's another piece of data that that uh, Jane Waldfogel and others have found that uh, the majority of the achievement gap that you'll find for 14 year olds is actually present. The majority of it is present on the first day of kindergarten. So, you know, you talk about inequality and very different experiences. Umberto, let's talk to you. You know, you talk about, uh, you know, you're looking at play. What are you seeing out there? You know, kind of what's the current state in the United States uh, when it comes to kind of what children do during during the day and kind of where, where, where do we need to go? Yes, well, it looks very different. You know, for, let's say, a family child care provider, a group family child care provider, I think they are very overwhelmed with everything they have to do. They're heavily regulated, um, yet they're not given the right resources. So I think their priority is to keep, keep the children safe. <laughs> um, so I think the learning piece and, and, and playing with them is very secondary. Um, because they're trying to keep the programs clean in case the health department just pays them a visit uh, all of a sudden. And um, so I think that is, is secondary. And whether they, maybe some of them are part of networks, so they also have to do a lot of data reporting through, um, let's say, teaching strategies gold. So they have to input a lot of data. So a lot of people actually have assistants who can track the children and, and do that. So I think there, sometimes they use games um, to track whether the kid is developing in gross motor or fine motor skills. And um, so th that's what I've seen in the field with um, family child care providers. I think those who work at centers may have much more support. And especially because children are the same age. So you know that you have a, a standard curriculum that you want to use for your two-year-old. That is not the case for a family child care provider who may have two infants, two, three-year-old, four, five-year-olds running around and it's a little bit more difficult. So I think you have more intentional um, learning opportunities in centers because it's a little bit more organized. And um, what um, we're trying to do for example, our right to play and, and our program here in New York City called Play at the Core is supporting all of these teachers around um, New York City, pre-K teachers, to use intentional play as a vehicle for learning. So, 
before I turn to you, Nina, uh, Fabian, do you want to talk a little bit more about that intentional play? You know, when we talk about uh, pre-K or universal pre-K, one of the arguments is school readiness. And there's sort of a feeling like, oh, where are the flashcards? And, you know, aren't you going to learn your letters? And, you know, here, here we are in the United States and we always want our kids to be ahead. And, you know, what's the APGAR score? Well, mine was better. And, you know, um, you know, can you talk a little bit about that kind of, a, you know, how is play the work of children, so to speak? And then is there kind of a, a bit of a pushback about that? And then we're going to go to Norway. Sure. I mean, I think Umberto could probably also really speak to this, you know, play as children's work. Um, but what we know about about how um, the early brain develops is that it really, um, children are natural scientists, they're explorers, they're creative, and that's how they're learning. When they're playing, when they seem to be, uh, you know, sort of just wasting time, quote unquote, they're actually learning a whole lot. We tend to see the world through our own eyes as adults, and we realize that, like, if we see the glass and we know that there's water in it, that if we pour, you know, tip it, that the water is going to pour out and it's going to make a mess. Children don't know that. Or even if they've experienced it once, they want to experience it about, I don't know, 500 more times before they, before they understand, how about what happens if I do it from here? What if I do it from here? 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 Um, that's how they are learning. That's physics, right? Um, and many, many examples of the kinds of activities that children naturally engage in because they are natural born scientists and explorers um, is really significantly important for their learning. Um, when, they ha when they are given the opportunity to explore those things, um, obviously in a safe environment, but also in an environment that isn't restrictive where the opportunities are being presented to them. I think the idea of intentional play is providing those opportunities for them to explore in ways that are safe, um, but also that really kind of invite that exploration and invite the, you know, the multiple um, opportunities to figure out how something works or um, what would happen if. Um, that's vitally important. Yeah. Okay. So, um, Umberto, is that happening? Yes. Well, is that happening enough? Some areas <laughs> of New York City, let's say. Um, but I agree. And I think what's so important about play and allowing children to play is that you're giving them the their own like ownership for their learning experience and that's how you start from a very young age to encourage children to learn and just be fascinated by things but again i think because you, let's say a family childcare provider um, needs to follow regulations you know she may not afford to be you know wasting water or you know water you know on the ground may be a hazard because someone could slip so i think and and again and it varies in in new york city because you have um family childcare providers that may have the space to do that, like physical space to do it, and others may have to go to the park, but it may actually be dangerous depending on the neighborhood where they live to actually go to the park and actually for the children to get dirty and play with sand and get the ability to run around. So it just it really depends. And I think especially in New York City, it, it's, it's a privilege to, be able to do all the things that Fabian described to be able to play around and, and, and discover. And, but at the same time, I think what we're trying to do a, a play of the core is, is allowing these communities to have that ownership and to create the space for children to have this experience of learning and discovering. All right, so now I want to talk to, to Nina. Let's hear about uh, the situation in Norway. We've been talking about play. We've been talking about universal child care. And I think what I didn't realize until a couple of years ago is that the United States actually, a uh, bipartisan effort in Congress, passed universal child care back in 1971. Um, and it actually got to the, the White House and President Nixon at the time was planning to sign it. He actually had his cabinet members in what was then HEW, Health, Education and Welfare, working behind the scenes to help craft the bill. And it got to the White House and that was, uh, there was a guy there named Pat Buchanan. And he was a uh, rising star from the right, and he was one of the speechwriters. And he had just returned. I went and talked with him for for my book. I wanted to try to understand why my life was so miserable with childcare. <laughs> and, uh, so I, I, I figured out he was really the person to talk to. So I, I went to his house uh, in Northern Virginia, where you walk in and there's a gigantic portrait of Robert E. Lee. It's like. Pat, you grew up in Chevy Chase, Maryland, you know? 
<laughs> at any rate, so you walk in, and uh, so so I, I was asking him what happened, and he said he had just come back from a trip to the Soviet Union, you know, within the Soviet Union. You've got to remember, 1971 is the height of the Cold War, and Vietnam's raging, and everybody's, you know, a uh, very scary time. And he said uh, he saw all of these little kids, like the young pioneers, marching around wearing the same uniforms. And that he was terrified. He thought that's what childcare was, that it, we would be sending all our children into a factory and it would just destroy the American family. So he convinced Richard Nixon to veto it. And then Pat Buchanan wrote the uh, veto language and uh, described childcare as basically, uh, you know, would make a, a Sovietize the family. And when I talked to him, he said, you know, we not, we not only wanted to kill the bill, we wanted to kill the very idea of child care in the United States, that children belong home with their mothers for cake and pie at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. So that's what happened in 1971 in the United States. And we never have talked about child care since. This is the first presidential election ever where we've had two major party candidates actually put forth child care proposals, however imperfect. Uh, in 2016. It was different in Norway. Nina, <laughs> tell us what happened. Make us cry. Well, it's, <laughs> it's interesting. You could have been ahead of us, right? If, if we hadn't gone to, to the Soviet Union. Yeah, so, so the expansion in Norway started also during the 70s, uh, driven uh, by the, the feminist movement. And uh, so the first expansion of childcare in Norway, you didn't actually see, there wasn't an effect on, on women's labor supply because they were already working, but they needed to have proper care for their children. So they had to kind of avoid what you had to do, like having one paid nanny to do this and run around. And so, so, so this was how it started. And for a long time it was, it was uh, like the, the children between, between three and, and, and six. Norwegian children start school at six. That would be in childcare. But uh, but recently, like from 2000 and onwards, they have also we have also expanded quite a lot for the youngest children. So so today most children are in childcare actually from from the age of one. But then before the age of one, we have have the parent leave. So so that's kind of there was someone we just talked about it that that here in the U.S. some some mothers have to send their two two weeks week old baby to childcare, and I I, can't, I have a one year old at home. I, I think it's hard to leave her now. I, I can't imagine doing that when she was so small. It doesn't really make any sense. Yeah, we were talking beforehand that um, there's one study that found that one in four um, uh, mothers in the United States, so about, about a quarter of all mothers, actually go uh, back to work uh, when their babies are two weeks old. They don't have any kind of paid family leave. They have to get back to work. And uh, I was on a radio show talking about the care report recently, and one of the advocates there said that in, the, in 25 states, it's illegal to separate a puppy from its mother before seven weeks. And yet here we've got so many hundreds and thousands of women going back to work when their children are two weeks old that there's just, I, did, I had to go look it up. It's actually a true statistic. It's, it's really cruel. Back to Norway. <laughs> Make us cry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, anyway, but, but, but what's nice is that we now, we can now actually look at how the children fare after these expansions of childcare. So we can, we, and, and there has been studies doing this, well-published studies, that looked at the expansion during the 70s. The childcare centre at that time is quite similar, actually, to the childcare centre today. Um, you have kind of more or less the same amount of, of uh, adults per child, uh, or ch children per adults. Oh. Uh, and and, and um, it's still very play-based because the Norwegian Child Care Centre is very play-based. Um, and what we see now is that these, these, uh, these children who are now, now adults, they actually they find that they earn more and they have a higher uh, probability of actually finishing high school and they actually also take more education. So, so somehow, even though they play, it's not very formal learning, they still seem to benefit. Uh, and, and we must remember then that these children actually went from, from informal care with kind of more informal caregivers and, and kind of probably mothers being very stressed, uh, going from one place to the other, not kind of feeling secure for her, their child and then to this more formal childcare centre setting. And also what's very interesting is that we find that, or they, the, this study that looks at the, the, the 70s expansion, they find actually also that 
the effects differ by family background. So for the, for the children from families where the mother has no education, they actually benefit more. So in that sense, it really, it re really levels the playing field, which I find kind of very, yeah, very interesting. That's very hopeful. When I was uh, reporting for the Care Index, I was down in Georgia, um, and I talked to one it was sort of um, with at the Atlanta Speech School, where they talk a lot about language nutrition and really trying to have sort of a, a very rich language environment. They do a lot of training for early care uh, teachers, and one thing they said is that by the age of five, uh, you've really gone a long way to determining that child's future. Um, so you said that you've also been looking at that inequality question. What have you found in some of your research with, um, you know, can you expand a little bit more on that? So we have, a, we have a study also of the youngest children and there we find a similar thing. We find that, uh, uh, so, so we actually, we actually we have a really nice uh, research setup where we can, uh, we, have, we have this lottery in, in, in the municipality of Oslo uh, and we can compare children who randomly was assigned to childcare because they, they applied to children who was not assigned because of a lottery. So basically there was oversubscription uh, during these years. Uh, and that's really nice. So what we find is that the ones who got childcare at age one, they are, they are also doing better. We, we can't really look at them for a long time because this is quite recent. But they actually do better in, in first grade on these school readiness tests. Uh, the ones that actually got admitted, whereas the, the others that actually also later enrolled, but they enrolled later, they are actually faring a bit worse. And this is also, uh, the, the here we also, we have a small sample here, so we can't really conclude, but, but we see that there are a tendency that also the children with, uh, with uh, lower educated mothers and low family income uh, do better. Uh, so, so that's also really interesting, I find. And I've also been looking at, at immigrant children. So in Oslo, we have a large share of, of, uh, of children are, are from immigrant families. And quite a few of them do not speak a lot of Norwegian when they start school, which really, of course, is a problem for, for the teachers when they're trying to teach the class. And so, so they, we, what we, they did in, in Oslo was they gave these children free childcare. So, so in, in city districts with a high share of children with immigrant background, they got a free childcare slot. Uh, all children got this actually during this, uh, these years. And what we find is that especially the girls improve uh, in school later on. So they do better in, in quite a few subjects. And uh, yeah, I also think that is quite interesting and, and very important in Norwegian uh, setting, I think. No, that's, it, that's so interesting. There's research here in the United States as well, the Heckman research, that if you, for every dollar invested in early care and learning, you have six, seven, sometimes eight, uh, you know, in return over the life course and higher earnings and greater educational attainment. Uh, and that still hasn't really um, moved the dial here. Um, what do you guys think about that? What's, what's it going to take to, uh, why hasn't it moved the dial and what's it going to take to move it here? Well, this is, you know, I'm not speaking from data, but I get to do that because I'm the photographer here. <laughs> um, so it's interesting to hear that so much of this came from our problems with, you know, national child care came from a feelings about women in the workplace. And from what I've seen and experienced that our culture has a really conflicted idea about motherhood. So we idolize this abstraction of motherhood as this woman who's all sacrificing and just wants to bake cake and pies at 3 p.m., which like, I don't want to do, first of all, but also that we devalue caretaking, but it's not that intentional play. It's not, you know, inquiry-based learning. It's not, uh, you know, these open-ended questions because they just, I mean, I don't know how they would have the time to figure out how to do right. that. So it's a place like this. It's already a center in the community that has that trust and that buy-in to families. Like, think what an important conduit that would be for this single working mother who is an immigrant who wants to you know, further her education, she could receive so much information through this place. Her children could receive so much additional education. There's the question of why she has to work two jobs to barely make a living. That's another story. So there's so much potential in this, and this is going to continue. This is going to continue to grow. The workforce. There will be more and more of us who are freelancers with unpredictable schedules. There are many people who have these automated schedules, and they'll need this kind of flexible childcare. And so these people are also. They have children too. It would be such a good, as you were talking, you know, an economist, this investment, it seems so obvious. But I think what's so difficult is that this is such a sensitive topic because all education, but especially early childhood education, asks the culture, what do you need to be a person? Mm -hmm. And our, our culture obviously has a lot of uh, a complex reaction to that.
Yeah, when we were uh, when I was reporting in Georgia, where uh, the infant care, uh, the state did its own study and they found that 70% of the infant care uh, was actually considered low quality. Um, you know, so when we were asking people about that, and they said, well, most of the policymakers are these kind of older mostly white guys, they grew up in breadwinner homemaker families, that's what they have, and the view is babies need to be home with their mamas. You know, pre-K, okay, because three-year-old, four-year-olds are kind of getting ready for kindergarten, but anything lower than that, there's a real dis discomfort about um, uh, thinking about it sort of systemically. You know, Fabian, what, what have you seen, uh, you know, over the, over the years, you know, we're talking about, um, you know, this is a, a, looks like a great, um, you know, potentially great uh, place for kids, but you've got uh, care workers or teachers who are exhausted and not trained well. And the whole idea of like the serve and return kind of interaction, that warm interaction between the caregiver or the teacher and the child is really the key to quality. Um, you know, what have you... Uh, this, this really just brings me back to my like graduate school readings about um, women in the workforce and, and uh, this conversation that we're having is just really about kind of like the anxieties of, of I think, um, a very, very unequal society where some people have access and other people don't and some people have privilege and other people don't. And um, it reminds me of, of my like first feminist, you know, class on, uh, we read this article, I wish I could remember the name of the author, it might be Higginbotham, but it was, we've, we were never on a pedestal. And that title was about women, women of color, immigrant women, who never had the luxury of being on a pedestal from which they could be knocked down. These are women who've always worked. These are women who, a lot of times, like especially in the case of enslaved women, who worked without pay. And these are women who could never afford the luxury of a breadwinner, homemaker model. And that's our history. And the idea that, that, that sort of this breadwinner homemaker is kind of going back to the good old days really has been debunked by um, historian Stephanie Kuntz in talking about the way that we never were. We have this fantasy about how we were. We never were. <laughs> that was a very small, you know, maybe five of us were that way. Um, but really looking at things, um, from a more realistic point of view about whose experiences are being lifted up as the standard, whose experiences are being lifted up as the norm, whose experiences are being lifted up as the way that we should be or the way that we are when in fact that represents such a tiny, tiny slice of, of our society. We have to have those conversations and I think part of making it real, I think Umberto's point is fantastic about how do we make this you know, kind of accessible, why should everyone care? I think part of that is recognizing that more of us share these issues, right, than don't. And I think that's one of the biggest um, uh, efforts as a society that we need to make in, in thinking, as we were talking before, about how, what are we gonna do on Wednesday? How are we gonna get over, regardless of what the result is, how, how are we gonna get over this? We're, we're in a rough time, you know, how are we gonna get there? And I think part of it is recognizing that we share more than, what, than we don't share. We share more of the difficulty and the complications and the how can we make it work and all of these things than, than what we don't share. And I think that's where maybe the conversation can begin and helping us to get to um, seeing, seeing one another um, as more alike than different. Good point. So, Nina, I want to ask you one last question, and then we're going to open it up for questions. You know, from uh, you know, from the kind of across the water, across the pond sort of perspective, from you know Norway or other countries. When you look in at the United States, here we are, one of the wealthiest countries on earth. Um, you know, and and you see the situation with working families with childcare or, or the fact that we have no paid leave. You know, what do we look like to the rest of the world? Be honest. <laughs> I, I just think for the entire globe here. No, <laughs> no I, I just think that it, it looks very hard. So, so there are so many people that has to work so hard to be able to support their family and, and then again have to kind of rely on, on, on unreliable childcare and, and trying to, to make this uh, patchwork of, of different arrangements. And, and, and I've, I've, I think that that sounds not only very hard, but also quite inefficient. So, so in that sense, I, I, I do think that 
I mean, the thing is that the Norwegian childcare center is not really perfect in the sense that you only have a lot of um, uh, very high skilled workers there. You, you have a lot of assistants that don't have any education. So, so basically, I think it's 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 not that. I think it's probably more or less the same people in in, in Norway that will take care of the children as as it would be kind of here in the U.S. Mm -hmm. But they would be nannies, maybe just taking care of the children in one one family. Whereas, how it's organized uh, in in Norway is that you would have Typically, like you will have one childcare teacher, and then you will, he or she would work with two assistants, and and then kind of so so you will have quite a low a lot of low skilled work there. But in that sense, it doesn't really need to be that expensive. Although I would love for them to earn more, but they don't. Really, it's not really a high income uh, occupation in Norway either, right? So, but 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 so 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 somehow it just seems to be a bit about how you organize it, right? And and then you have to acknowledge that, I mean, this is really making things really hard for many people, especially, of course, the more low-income families. So, yeah. Absolutely. All right, well, at this point, I'd love to open it up for questions. Yeah. Good evening, and thank you. Uh, as you were speaking, I kept having this this uh, this remembrance of the of Walmart and those scenarios that uh, that we've seen I'm curious because in a lot of ways we're speaking to the choir or the converted here and what I would like the panel to possibly introduce is what how might you present this argument to those who don't, who have a dissenting opinion about this issue in a way that doesn't allow those uh, to then offer, to make you lessen the demand or the need for? Uh, because too often we're having to settle or we're having to scale back. And this is an issue that has you know, too many ramifications, you know, for the benefit versus the loss. And to raise, to frame the argument in a way that makes it not just palpable, but makes it, you know, not, not even something that you negotiate on, but, but a demand and something that everyone can appreciate. We're all children and those children who have had access to have benefited and that benefit has benefited, you know, writ large. So. That's my question. Um, one thing that I think, I mean, the reason that I'm a photographer is that I think photographs can work on your thoughts, but they can also work in your guts. And so this conversation is sort of largely focused for a while a lot on like Marissa Mayer's in, in office nursery and like corporate women and typically very privileged women who, no disrespect to their battles, they were fighting. Um, I wanted to look at a group of people that wasn't that. And I think one thing that might be a model is the success of universal pre-K here in New York City, because it wasn't marketed as like, uh, you know, something that would address poverty. Our country has a, there's a tendency to be pretty vicious and about programs targeting low-income people and whatever. <laughs> I think the fact that UPK was, was their slogan says pre-K for all. And so it came across as all these middle class for families were, families were very excited and also low income people. So I don't know if that is a helpful way of sort of bundling these sort of programs that like they will benefit many families. Um, and also to me, it's important that we continue to talk about this in ways that are both, you know, very factual and also work sort of emo on an emotional level. I could just add that I think that it has been a discussion in Norway that universal programs has its own kind of, there is something about them that makes them kind of stable in the sense that because everybody actually has access to this, although, so like for instance, we all pay a quite low fee, although we have, of course, uh, th very different salaries, uh, not as different as in the US, I might add, but but still, but but there is something stable in 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 that, 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 that because that means that like in in the elections everybody will support it because it won't only be for the low income families, it will also be for the high income families, and somehow that is some of the idea of the universal universal thing, right? That that it also makes it kind of. Interesting also for the middle class. 
Right, right. I think, uh, I think Nina makes an excellent point. Uh, and there's been research that shows that you get a lot more buy-in when you do have universal programs. Uh, you know, back in 1971, the, the Universal uh, 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 Child Development Fund, uh, it was envisioned to be open to everyone on a sliding scale. And so it got a lot of buy-in, both from Republicans and Democrats at the time. There were Gallup and Harris polls that showed widespread support among Republicans and Democrats, men and women. So I think that that's a really good point. Um, and I think Alice is, is right if you look at the history of the way we have designed or actually really failed to design well uh, programs that, that, that are directed at low income or, or uh, families in poverty, for instance, just trying to get a child care subsidy. To, I, I, I've interviewed people who had to start standing in line at three in the morning and then like lost the job that they needed the child care subsidy for. So we design programs very, uh, not only inefficiently, but very cruelly. Uh, and so the more that you can bring that out of the kind of the, the stigma of, of poverty and really make it for everybody, uh, again, on a sort of a fair sliding scale, I think that that's probably the best thing to do. Next question, anybody? Yeah. Uh -huh. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, uh, um, <clears throat> uh, th there's no comparison between the United States and Norway. We don't believe in social social democracy. We uh, have a very pluralist uh, population, uh, whereas Norway is, is, is much more homogeneous, with the exception of the, the immigrants. Um, but we, um, uh, we 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 um, believe in individualism, and and uh, we. Uh, uh, really don't care. We don't need the lowest two-fifths of the labor force, and we're trying to figure out what to do about that. You couldn't get Social Security passed today, much less universal child care. Um, uh, uh, you know, we've got people who want to, what little uh, affordable care emerged from Obama's program. We have people who want to eliminate that. Uh, and, and those conflicts are not going away. Um, uh, and so we have a much more complex problem here. Some people have said we should give this to the churches and let them deal with it. Uh, uh, but, you know, one of the realities is that uh, uh, if you earn between 100, as a total family income, you have between 150 and 300 thousand dollars a year. You can afford uh, child care. You can afford housing costs and all of that. Um, when you're below that level, uh, you're in a fairly de desperate situation. Just paying housing costs is is is, is enormous, uh, and uh, figuring out what to do with your kids um, is is even greater crisis. And so you put your kids wherever you can. And stories are coming out. These kids are being heavily abused. Black kids are being abused more than white kids, but we don't care about that. Um, and, uh, uh, and these are the complexities of the issue. Uh, it, you know, it's easy to pull on people's heartstrings and talk about uh, people making you cry and all this stuff, but the reality is that, that we have a a, 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 a social culture uh, that is unique in the world, and we have to figure out how to address these problems within the context of that culture, and none of you are talking about that. So I wish you would. Thank you. All right, well, let's talk about that within the unique uh, American culture. Uh, we have the Affordable Care Act, and uh, I stopped counting at about 40 when the Republicans in Congress tried to uh, keep voting to overturn it. Um, it, we could never get the you know social security passed today or the the 1938 fair labor standards act no doubt um you know sort of the the, the underpinnings that we do have today uh, what do you think about that the current reality it's not easy i mean i <laughs> I'm not going to say that it's something that can be easily addressed. I mean, to me, one thing that I notice in the photographs that I take is all these women work really hard. They're very devoted to their careers. That's a very American thing to be um, ambitious and, you know, very single, not single focused, but uh, very driven in your career and looking at, they also didn't want to take time off. Neither did I because of the economic costs. Like there is a part of this that's not just about like peace, love and understanding. It's about a career focused thing. And so my job is to document, but also to, you know, photographs aren't windows, they comment on the culture also. And so I can't say that they're gonna change. I don't think that a politician is gonna see a picture I took and have a change of heart, but that's the method that I work in through photography and education. And I think that those are the, you know, effective tools that I have. So I don't have a sweeping solution to it and I share your frustration, but I think that the work that we're each doing in our own fields is an important part of, of making the change. Right, and the best thing we can do is do things like this, have conversations. You know, we- Well, we don't have street urchins. 
trying to avoid that. That's a new tagline, maybe, for the work that we're doing, <laughs> avoiding street urchins. No street urchins yet. Yeah. OK, over here. I, uh, I actually do have a question, but I just wanted to respond to that. Um, I think that as we, uh, especially with the election tomorrow, as we tend to see more and more people um, coming into office and getting elected into office who have faced these struggles, I would imagine that we're also going to see that change. I would bet Pat Buchanan never worried about $20 for his babysitter when he was stuck in traffic when he made that decision. So I think as we're seeing more and more young people, both men and women, who are young parents who have, have faced these struggles that we'll see more change um, addressed to that. And I think that sort of gets more to that point of like, how do we balance that with our sort of unique um, standing as Americans, what our beliefs are. But my question actually is about quality. And I wanted to ask a little bit more about the report. If you could talk a little bit more about what did you look at when you were looking at quality? What did that mean? How did you define it? A little bit more about that. Sure. And, you know, that was actually one of the biggest challenges that we had in the report is how do you define quality and what are some measures that you could use since we were looking at it state by state, what were some measures that we could use that we could actually use to compare state by state. Um, so there are a number of states that are moving to something called the quality rated system. Um, and some of that is uh, some of that is great. Some of it is sort of like <laughs> safety and make sure you don't spill the water so that children slip and fall. Um, you know, which is really sort of like uh, setting the table, but not really getting, you know, getting the meal. Um, the best indicator of quality really is. Uh, it's like uh, there is a measure, it's called class, where you really look at the, uh, you observe the warm interaction between a teacher and a, and a child. Well, that's subjective. It's incredibly expensive to do. Uh, and so not a lot of states are doing it or they don't have the same standards. So we initially wanted to kind of reward states for doing that kind of observational, uh, you know, uh, look at real quality, uh, but we just weren't able to. So what we did is we looked at uh, national accreditation data for uh, family homes and also for centers. Again, it's imperfect, and you'll see in our methodology, we're very transparent about all of that. Um, we felt that it wasn't a perfect marker, but it was a marker to show that uh, providers had gone through some steps, had uh, taken some effort to, um, to meet some standards. And again, a lot of it is, uh, is sort of like setting the table, but not necessarily getting the meal. So it's an imperfect standard, but really the best quality that the, you know, the, the research will show is that, that warm relationship that a child learns when somebody who is memorable, who cares about them and knows them, actually pays attention to them. They call it the serve and return kind of interaction. Um, uh, and so, I, you know, for a parent, that's what you want to be looking for when you, when you go in. And the only thing I'll say about Pat Buchanan, um, he didn't have any children. Oh. Yeah. OK, next question. <laughs> Switch off. OK. Um, I just, you know, the, in, in you know, this this uh, the gentleman here was asking. So, how can we, how can we um, make this something that 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 more of us care about? Um, I'm not an economist, obviously, so so maybe this is a question for for um, Dr. Dranga. But but um, it strikes me just hearing that that data about the number of uh, child care providers who are receiving public assistance. You know. The American taxpayer is essentially subsidizing those low salary, like basically those low salaries. So I wonder if, 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 there, if there's a way to call, if there are tweaks there, you know, or if, if there's a way to sort of call attention to the fact that we are actually paying for it one way or another, you know, whether we're paying for it in food stamps or whether we are giving people higher salaries that will enable, give them a kind of a greater degree of self-respect and, and maybe make them less likely to be depressed while they're caring for our children. I, you know, I'm, um, yeah, I just, I, I, don't, I don't know enough about the, the hard economics to have a sense of what those answers might be, but I wonder if there are answers in that. Um, well, I'm not an but, economist either, uh, but I really don't think, I think that one of the things that has been revealed very clearly in this political climate is that people are very motivated to believe what they want to believe and not necessarily to be compelled by facts. <laughs> so that I think that there are, there is a, a ton of 
wonderful economic research. There is a group of economists at, in Chicago who are doing, you know, fantastic work showing all of these things, showing, like, people have been talking about the sandbox investment, you know, for years, and how the, the importance of investing in early childhood only has positive returns. And at the end of the day, people are stuck with their ideologies, and I think this speaks to this point that you were making. People are just wedded to their ideologies, and they will not be swayed by, you know, fantastic, well-conducted research that has that shows if we do this, we, the return is better. We're paying more money, folks. You know, we're, pay, we're paying more money having folks in jail. We're paying more money by not investing in childcare. We're paying more money by having these low incomes. We're paying more money when people are depressed. And it's just, well, but mothers should be home with their children. It's sort of like people are going to just stand and die on that hill. And until they're willing to step down off of it, it's sort of like, well, you know what I mean? So, yeah. I mean, that's why I believe so strongly in the power of narrative. What you said about we were never on a pedestal is such a good point. Mm -hmm. And I also think that's why we as journalists, we don't just give you, when we write a piece or do a photo story, we don't just give you facts. We need those. It would be nothing without the work you do. But after we have this conversation, we're all going to get together, and I bet the first thing that's going to come out of our mouths is either a personal story about our own struggles with childhood or a story about someone we knew. Mm -hmm. And that's what ends up happening in our political conversations, too, is that this is pinned to narrative. So it is about shifting the narrative. And I also wanted to bring you in on this, too, <laughs> because I think there is a lot of privilege and inequality in who gets to play freely. Yes. I mean, children in private schools yes. are encouraged to be, you know, play with manipulative and explore the world and have this privilege to say to those children, this world is yours to explore and make, w make of it what you will, right. where lower income students are there's a lot of controversy over the charter school movement, which I can't speak to. I'm not an expert in that at all. But there's a tendency to focus on um, pretty binary metrics like test scores and that kind of stuff. And so right. the, changing that narrative also. Yeah, and this goes back to the way we measure quality. Mm -hmm. For example, I can say that here in New York, we do it through the classroom assessment scoring system, the class, which kind of like, are you familiar with it? Yeah, and then we also use environment rating scales like the Eckers, the Feckers, the Edders. And I think a lot of the teachers um, make it very intentional to hit every single point in those rating scales. And then they forget about interactions. And they forget about you know, how to um, support the social emotional development of their children. So that's where we're kind of like missing the, map, the mark. Okay. <laughs> yes. Do you feel like these tools actually measure quality? They measure parts of quality. Mm. Um, you know, we have, we have uh, in our, our full set of standards, there's 75 standards there in four mm. different areas. So they're looking at things like the environment, they're looking at things like teacher qual uh, qualifications and experience, they're looking at management and leadership. And so, you know, there's, there's a lot of different parts of, of what makes a good quality center and how do we sort of figure out how to, how, to, how to be really good in each of those four different centers. And um, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of ways to do that, um, but we lack, I think, that not only the funding, but somewhat of the infrastructure in New York State mm. to really make sure that there's access to good quality professional development for all the child care providers who are out there, no matter what they're sending. So that's really something that we continue to work on. Wait, but hold on. So, so what do you think it's missing, right? Because you just said it measures some, like, you know, aspects of quality. So, what's, what do you think it's missing from, like, just class ERS? Yes. So, all the sort of business practices that go mm. with how you operate childcare as a business, mm -hmm. and how you operate as a business, and how you operate as a business. But they do receive that training sometimes. Like it's part of, you know, when they renew their licenses every two years, they have to have at least how many hours of training, Madeline? Is it three hours of training on business? 
No, I know, but it's like, yeah. That it's not at all tied to what they actually need. <laughs> there are these nine subject areas that just say, you need to have this and you need to have some of this over the course of two years. Mm -hmm. But we need to do better at responding to the needs of the workforce right. and really meeting them where they're at. They might, there a lot of people are already bringing strengths. They don't need two more hours of one particular area, they need five more hours than this. Right. So, like, changing some of that approach, I think, could really help as well. One, one more question. Okay, one more question. Uh, I have the mic. <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm, I'm sorry about the timing of this question because the conversation had shifted since a little bit, but it still relates to culture. Uh, I was just struck by what was brought up earlier, the culture of individualism. I, I, I come from Europe, from a country um, where we get paid um, um, maternal and parental leave for three years, and there's a public, uh, public system um, uh, that starts at three years of age, which is of pretty good quality, but it also happens to be one of the most uh, secular countries in the world, if not the most secular country in the, in the world. And I wonder what is the panel's opinion on how big of a role does uh, religion, Christianity play in this? Because as an outsider, my perspective has always been that it's not really the individualism, it's the high regard, incredibly high regard, in which heterosexual uh, married couples are held in this country. And the implication that if you strayed from this model, God forbid you got divorced or you did not get married, you kind of deserve to be punished. Or it's actually okay to neglect you and, um, or to neglect your family or the needs of your children because you had strayed. And while uh, I'm from the Czech Republic and that country is in many ways imperfect, the, the, one of the reasons that this system exists is actually individualism and the fact that it's nobody's business what your family arrangement is, it makes no difference whatsoever. And I, I wonder if you think that religion plays a role in this. Mm. Love to hear from the panel. Yeah, I, I do and I've, um, so I think that there is a very puritanical um, notion of family and a very puritanical notion of motherhood in particular that has shaped a lot of um, not only in childcare but actually my a lot of my research is around the relationship between families and schools and how the role of a good involved parent is framed and who is a good involved parent a good involved parent is a heterosexual white middle-class mother who is available to bake cookies volunteer come to the school um, that's a that's the good involved parent. Anyone else is a deviation from that, and that's va that's based on a completely puritanical heteronormative approach to families. It's not reality. Once again, so I think that that's absolutely a hundred percent dead on. I also think that in terms of the individualism, it's, it it reflects. I think that um, we're really deeply conflicted in the United States. That that our culture reveals many many conflicts about. So we want we want the complete independence. I mean, I think you were talking about this, right? The the idea that we want hands off unless it's about our uteruses, right? So it's like there, we ha we are ve really deeply conflicted about how much of the in government's involvement we want, how much of the church's involvement we want, how much of independence and individuality we want. Um, there, w there are so many unresolved questions about about uh, what it means to be, you know, this union or or whatever. And I think that's reflected in in all of these policies. And I think that's why our policies. That's why you have such a patchwork approach. I think the patchwork approach is a perfect reflection of like this patchwork of values or ideas or ideals and, and goals and objectives. I mean, I think it's sort of um, what we're living is a, is a reflection of, um, of all these unresolved questions. Do we have time for more or is it time to? Just one more. Just one more? Okay, here. Uh, Hold on one second. On Excuse me, ma'am. Ma'am. And remember, we, there, we'll, we'll have hors d'oeuvres and wine so we can continue the conversation uh, more informally. Okay. In the U.S., are there employers who provide child care for the mothers and the children? Um, or sponsor schools who do it? There are, you know, you know there, um, uh, the Families and Work Institute is probably the, the, the best source of data that we have um, on uh, and the Society for Human Resources Management on what's available out there. 
And there are companies that offer on-site child care. Uh, they're 7% of all companies. And that's down from 9% a few years ago. Um, most companies, uh, they will offer what they call a, it's like a dependent care um, savings account. But that really doesn't cost them anything. It's you provide money, and they'll hold it for you. And then you can uh, pay your uh, up to like $2,500 per kid in um, pre-tax uh, dollars. But that's, uh, again, they're not spending any money on that. So um, some companies do. Patagonia has wonderful uh, on-site child care. The uh, founder, Yvonne Schoenard, when somebody said, what's the best thing Patagonia makes? He says it's the children in our early childhood development center. So there are companies like that, but they're very few. So. Uh, but this is a conversation. This is shifted into a conversation around class. Mm -hmm. Okay, and class ultimately is the language that racism speaks. Mm -hmm. So I mean, we can frame it however way that's palpable for us. You know, so we're able to leave and have great hors Thank you so much. But <laughs> let's be clear that ultimately what we're talking about. You know, we're, we're framing it underneath a middle class parameter, but it needs to be spoken for individuals who are on or below the poverty line. Of course, Buchanan was never having a conversation or a conflict about $20 an hour for his child care. One, because he probably wasn't paying his child care $20 an hour. But, and, and we were providing he didn't, <laughs> he didn't have but, kids. But, but ultimately, you know, we need to really look at it from the perspective of the individuals who are actually performing the job, performing the service. And then what is that conversation like? And how do then we move those individuals who are in positions of power and privilege so that they can actually appreciate what it actually means? Yeah, I think that's what the whole conversation's been about. I think it's been very much about, you know, uh, looking at this universally from in terms of uh, the children uh, as well as looking at the caregivers as really part of the solution as well. Well, listen, thank you all so much for coming. This has been a fantastic conversation. Thank you.